Good morning. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Brethren Church on this cool Sunday morning. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, first off, right after church today, there's a bell choir uh, practice. I'm sorry, the bell practice and also adult um, choir practice right after church today. Um, young Adults Bible Study will meet this Tuesday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. at the Burfines. Faith Kids will also meet on Wednesday at 6.45 p.m. And there will be a Lenten service at 7 p.m. this Wednesday. All families are welcome. This Saturday, March 4th, is the specialty dinner at 5 p.m. Uh, please bring a dish or dessert to share. Sign up is in the foyer. Also, um, you may have noticed when you came in the foyer this morning, um, there is a, a fundraising going on for the van. Uh, the church has decided to um, get a new van. Um, so please uh, prayerfully uh, consider giving towards uh, a new van for the church. Um, we need this van for uh, several different uh, reasons, but uh, please just consider giving towards the van. Um, now let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness and your love. We thank you for the opportunity to come before you in worship. As we start the service this week, we ask that you be with us in every, every aspect of this service and that you be glorified through this service. Pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, if you can, please stand and greet those around you. We'll open with the third verse of Holy, Holy, Holy. Stay seated. Today's psalm reading is Psalm 32, verses 1 through 7. Reading in Jesus' name. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found, 
Surely, when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Our opening hymn talks about spiritual warfare. It's Faith is the Victory in your hymnals, number 727. Let's stand.
I guess I'm reading scripture today. Scripture reading today is Romans 5, verses 12 through 19, reading in our Lord Jesus' name. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? There, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in the justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father God, I thank you, God, for your redeeming us, for your salvation, Lord for paying the sins for all of us, Lord. Through you, Lord, we have redemption. Through you, Lord, we have eternal life. Lord, I pray for um, the service today, Lord, those who um, are here listening, those who are listening on the line as well, Lord, that we hear the message you have brought before us today, Lord, through Tony. I pray, Lord, to give him peace and a clarity of thought, Lord, as he brings your word, Lord, and give us open hearts and ears to receive it, that may we take this word out to the world around us and give you glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
before Pastor Tony comes, a hymn of prayer and exhortation. 713 in our hymnal, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. Let's stand. You may be seated. I have an announcement before I go into our sermon text for today. As many of you know, we were trying to host the Hillcrest uh, Choir concert here. But the last time that we hosted them many years ago, there was only about 30 some odd beds we needed to fill. And this time it was over 50 beds that needed to be filled. And what we did as a church was really amazing is that we were able to get so many uh, beds available for them to stay over, but we did come in short and having to give them enough time to reschedule to try to find another church along their route, I had to cancel our concert uh, for the 27th, the Monday night. But I do that with saying to you how proud I was of our congregation because you guys really did step up that if they were the size they were years ago, we would have been able to house them. But uh, because the concert itself grew, the amount of people or more than we could handle, I had to let it go. And so please, I want you to know it's uh, in one way, I'm sorry they can't be here being I'm alumni, but at the same time, I get it and I appreciate everyone that stepped up. I really do. Now, with that being said, I'm going to be taking today to speak on Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Very familiar passage. Many of you have heard it numerous times, but this time maybe you're going to learn something you didn't know before. Chapter 4, verse 1, reading in our Lord Jesus' name. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will commend, command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Heavenly Father, today is an important text for us, for we each get tempted. But maybe today we'll find how to be equipped for when that time comes. And I pray that we, like Jesus, would be able to use your word correctly to defend ourselves against all evil and falsehood. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What I need to do 
is this is one of those texts, because we're so familiar with it, we just jump into what I've just read without giving you some context. And the best way to do that is we're going to go just back to chapter 3, the end of chapter 3. And this is a very important moment. This is where John the Baptist sees Jesus. Jesus says he needs to be baptized. John the Baptist is going, no, no, it should be the other way around. I'm not worthy to baptize you. Jesus insists. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And after Jesus is baptized, we know what ends up happening. It says, you know, within the text that Jesus was just baptized. The heavens open up. The Spirit descends on Jesus. The Father speaks, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Now, for a special note aside, many people like to argue the fact that, you know the word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible? You know, that, that it's, just, it's a term. But yet, in that text I just read about the baptism, you do realize all three persons of the Trinity are there at that event. You know, we have Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father all present in this one moment very, very important because all three are there because now comes an important time for Jesus Christ. This is why he came. He is going to come and begin his three-year ministry all the way to the cross. This is why he was born. This is why he is here. This is his purpose and meaning, and it's all put into place with the Father's affirmation, the Spirit's leading, and Jesus being the one to submit. So, here we go. After Jesus' baptism, his three-year ministry began. But he ha- I want you to think, if you like taking notes, these are little things I'd like you to think about. This is from me. This is not from a commentary. Uh, there are four things I believe that Jesus came to do in those three years. The first one is submit himself fully to the will of the Father. That was number one. He came to do the will of God. So that's number one. Number two to serve both God and man. He said he was a servant. He didn't come to be served, correct? Throughout scriptures. Third, to sacrifice everything, including his own life. That's what Jesus came to do. Number four, save mankind from their sin. This is what his three-year ministry is to include, all four of those things. Now, why is that important that I said that? Because this is exactly, those four things are what the devil is going to try to stop and going to attack. He wants to stop Jesus from fulfilling his three-year mission, and he's going to do it by tempting him. And in those temptations, I want you to look for how the devil attacks those four things. Because you're going to see it everywhere throughout. Now there's another aside. For those of you that like to study the scriptures... I want you to realize all three temptations, everything that Jesus says, is all summed up in Deuteronomy. So people always like to say, what does the Old Testament have to do with the New Testament? Jesus right now is going to tie together his mission and what happens in Deuteronomy. So when you hear him quoting scripture, he's quoting from Deuteronomy. But he's also going to do something else, which I'm going to get to right now, and that's in the first temptation. The first temptation is what we see is this. When you read scripture, there's going to be a little bit more teaching here. There'll be practical stuff in a minute, but I want you to really think about this. When reading scripture, you should always ask questions on what you've just read. You have to ask questions. You can't just take it, read it, and say, okay, move on to the next But you want to involve yourself in the Word of God. You want to connect to the Word of God. And the best way to do that is have a little pad, if you have, and you write down the questions that come from the text that you might have, all right? Then what you do is you don't answer those questions by your own intellect. You allow the Word of God to answer those questions that have arose, and then this way you know you're right. Now, when I read the first temptation, I came up with four things, I'm running on a pattern here, four things, four questions that came to mind when I read that text. First one, why was Jesus led into the desert by the Holy Spirit? He didn't just decide to go into the desert. He didn't get baptized and go, all right, I'm going to cut through the desert so I can get over to here. No, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert. Why? 
Number two, why was Jesus fasting? What does that have to do with anything? Why would Jesus fast? Going through the desert. Shouldn't you have some supplies? Shouldn't you have some food? These are the questions you should be asking the text. What exactly is going on? Number three, why did Jesus need to be tempted by the devil? Do you notice how behind this, God set all this up? It didn't just so happen. Jesus is walking through the desert, desert and the devil pops up. This is all according to a plan. This is all what's going on. So that means if it's a plan, there's a purpose. That God has a purpose for this temptation. Number four. What is significant about the number 40? What? It's, you know, the Bible always has numbers. You know, for this, seven for completion, and this one for that, and that's it. And you just go, why 40? Now, they were the questions I asked in the text. Now, let me see if the Bible can answer my questions for me. Here we go. What was God's plan and purpose? Why, why did this event take place? To fix a past wrong. I want to make that clear. To fix a past wrong. Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 3. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Now listen to this, verse 2 of chapter 8. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness for these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger. Wow, okay, I'm starting to see some connection happening here, but let's keep going. And then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, do you see the connection there? That's exactly how Jesus is going to respond. But now let me connect these two. Deuteronomy and what's going on with Jesus. God brought his people out of slavery. And led them into the desert. You realize that, right? In Exodus, we see the story. Where all of a sudden, Moses is... First, he goes to Pharaoh and starts telling him about the plagues. And he didn't believe it until the very final plague. And so we, the people got to see the miracles of God. They were freed by Pharaoh. They were crossed the Red Sea. Remember that miracle? And now, all of a sudden, they're in what we're going to call the wilderness wandering. They were led there by God into the desert. It didn't take long, though, before the people began to grumble and complain. What did they grumble and complain about? Do you remember? Food and water. Food and water. You're starting to see some, maybe connect the dots. Then we go, the people did not trust God to care for their basic needs. They saw firsthand the power of God, but still couldn't trust him to care for them. So what is the result? The people failed the test. You understand that, right? Their hearts showed exactly what they were. Untrusting people. Who God was leading, but they weren't really following. Now, what did Jesus come to do? Now to connect that story to Jesus. Jesus was led into the desert for God's purpose. You understand, right? Just like the original chosen people. Jesus fasted 40 days. One day for every year of the wilderness wandering. He suffered from hunger, but did not grumble or complain. He trusted God to care for him. The devil's scheme to have Jesus repeat the failure of God's people. It worked once. Why wouldn't it work again? They're so weak. Imagine what people will do for hunger. How many Bible stories do we have people trading their birthright for stew? <laughs> wow, funny what happens, what we'll do when we're hungry. The devil's temptation 
He wanted three things from Jesus. Stop trusting God to provide. Follow your desire, which means you're hungry. Turn these stones into bread. You have the power to change yourself. You have the power to change this yourself, I'm sorry. Just do it. Just do it. You can do it. Jesus' response, Matthew 4, 4, of course. Man, it's not really Deuteronomy. Man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus used this passage of Scripture to show the devil he trusted God, unlike the people of old. Jesus passed the test. He passed the test. He didn't give in to his hunger. He didn't grumble. He followed the Father's will. He did everything he was supposed to do. And he won the first test. So I want you to see he corrected a past wrong. That's what he did in that very first temptation. But now what I want to do is bring it to us, if you don't mind. You go, well, what's, how do we apply this? That's a lot of head knowledge, but how do I apply this? The devil still uses the same temptation on us that he used on Jesus. The devil wants to have you not trust God. That's all he wants. Don't trust him. Bring in doubt. Bring doubt into your heart and into your mind. And it starts like this. Have you ever questioned if God really cares? I, I mean it. Have you really been in a bad situation? And it seems like that bad situation just doesn't seem to go away. In fact, at times it goes from bad to worse. To where you're just at a place where it's like, I'm not winning. It's like swimming against the current. And no one's there, no lifeguard, nobody's there to help me. God, where are you? Have you ever had that? That you just wonder, do you care? Do you see what's going on? We're only as good as what we can see. The problem is God is better than what we can't see. You understand? Just because we can't see God working doesn't mean he isn't. And just because it feels that God isn't the providing, he is. That's why you're still breathing. That's why you're still able to keep going. We see a lot of cruelty in this world. And I think a lot of people suffer from a lot of pain. And people are starting to really, Christians, question the goodness of God. And you hear it this way. If God's good, how can he allow? You ever hear that? If God is really good, how could he allow this to happen to me? How can it allow that to happen to them? How can he allow it to happen to us as a nation? Everything we face is a product of sin. Most of the time, the things that we are having a problem with or we're suffering from was a self-inflicted sin wound. Bad choices we made, following our hearts, running away, and we blame God. Don't you care? Yeah, he does. And just because God doesn't remove the pain you feel or the difficulty you're in, doesn't mean he doesn't care. He's with you. He loves you. He's provided for you when this life is over. He never promised to take away our problems. I don't see that in Scripture. You know what he promised? I'll walk through them with you. I'll be there with you in them. You understand? Too many times we allow those things from outside to have us question the goodness of God. And that's exactly what the devil wants. Because once you start questioning the goodness of God, you're on a path away from God. No doubt. My other part is, you question his, his uh, provision, but then you question God's ability. How can God help us in this? Can God even do anything? This is bigger than anyone can handle. 
those little comments? Is anything too big for God to handle? There are things too big for us to handle. <laughs> that, no doubt about that. But there's something bigger that God can't handle? So I can't trust myself because I already said <laughs> there's things bigger than us. So I guess I have to trust in something that can't be defeated, and that's God. And I'm going to trust him, even in the dark moments, even in the hard times. How about you? Or are you going to question his goodness, question his abilities? You don't, take, you don't need to. That's just the devil trying to stir it all up and to have you doubt. The other is this, and this is a big one to me. It seems so subtle, and it didn't seem wrong. Jesus, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. What is wrong with that? Think about it. Is that sinful? It's sinful to turn stones to bread? Is that what the devil's getting at? No. The thing is, act on your impulse because you're hungry. Do what you desire. Act on it. Act on it. Instead of sacrifice, submit to your desires. That's exactly what the devil says to us. Instead of sacrifice, and in other words, going without what the world goes with, I do not submit to my earthly desires that way. My sinful desires that way. Instead, the Christian is supposed to be self-controlled and not act on our urges. But isn't that really what people do today? They see it, they want it, they go for it. And why? It looked good. I just wanted it. You know how many live families have been ruined, lives have been ruined, just because of no impulse control? I saw somebody else, and a marriage is fragmented. I just wanted to experience, and lives are ruined. That's all the devil wants, is for you to act on the impulse. And as a Christian, I understand, because we are told by the Word of God there are many things we are not to have, and we are children. We don't want to admit it. I don't care. I'm a 61-year-old child. Because the minute you tell me I can't have something, I want it. That's why I can't say I want to go on a diet because I'll raid the refrigerator. It's my nature. It's yours too. It's yours too. And the devil knows it. Because what he does is said, look at all this world is offering. It'd be great to be with him. It'd be great to be with her. Oh, it'd be nice to try that. Oh, this is a great supplement to your relationship. Just go on the computer and watch that for a while. You know what I mean. It's funny. It seems so harmless. You're just acting on impulse. Yeah. And then you find yourself broken. Broken. Separated hurting. Hmm. Kind of interesting, isn't it? You want it, you can have it, and you tell yourself you deserve it. Just go for it. And then what follows is, I'm sorry. This first temptation, Jesus didn't just fix one wrong. He fixed another one. He did what we can't do. He was able to stand up to the devil and do what was right. But I think each and every one of us has listened to his voice. We went for a little dance with the devil. We practiced a little bit of what he wanted us to do. Because we're weak, sinful people. But Jesus came with victory. He defeated the devil, but better than that, he defeated him for us. The weak. The easily led astray. In that first temptation, 
you start to feel freedom. Because it sounded like in the beginning the devil had a hold on us and we couldn't be set free. Jesus Christ broke that hold. Broke it. I want to bring you to this point here. This is why a Christian needs to know God's Word. So they can see the devil's schemes and fight against temptation. I love this. It's from Psalm 119. And if you know Psalm 119, it's all about God's Word. It really is. It's all about meditating on God's principles and that and precepts. But this here I want to share with you from verses 33 through 37. The psalmist writes, Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow them to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the paths of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart towards your statues, not towards selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. If you're in the Word of God and you're trying to understand it, you're asking questions of it, you're learning from it, at the same time, it's equipping you to be able to see the devil's schemes in the everyday. That you'll be able to see that's a lie. My acting on that will ruin me and my family. My desire to do this isn't even good for me. And for me to step and get into that, I'm walking away from God. See, when you're in the Word, that light onto my path, shining bright, exposes the potholes so you don't trip, you don't fall. But if you're not in the Word, you're easily led astray. You're going to listen, and you're going to fall because you're already in the darkness. Second test here we go. The devil's scheme to have Jesus test God. To have Jesus publicly show everyone who he is before God's appointed time. To have Jesus save himself by say, using supernatural means. The devil's use of scripture. You know, the devil quotes from Psalm 91, 11 through 12 in the second temptation. And that's where we start to see where the devil comes in and says, uh, first off, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will commend his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands and so that, that you will not strike your foot against a stone. See, that's what's going on. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems to me the devil quotes scripture. <laughs> that was something to ask some questions about, right? If you're reading the text, you should go, really? He knows that book too? <laughs> Maybe better than you. Maybe better than you. Using Scripture for his own gain and purpose, the devil does. I see it done all the time here. Not the church, but around me. Jesus' response Jesus shows that he can see through the devil's scheme, which is what we need to be able to do. Jesus properly uses Scripture to reject the devil's challenge because he combats it from Deuteronomy. He passed the second test. You realize? The first one had a lot of meat. Now you notice how the tests are getting shorter and shorter. The devil's losing. I love this. It's kind of like, oh... Okay, now it's going to be here, here. And then he's going to go for the big hit at the end. Application for the Christian under the second temptation. How people test God. <laughs> if God is who he says he is, why doesn't he show himself to me? If God is real, show me. Now you say, oh, people don't say that. Yeah, but you kind of think it. Uh, I, I'd love to believe that God is here, but I need to feel him. 
you're testing them. When you play those games, I need to know God is with me. Have you read your Bible? That's all you need. But no, people are looking for something bigger than that. I need to have a sign. I need to see something. I need to feel something. That's testing God. Testing. We believe what is written. We believe what is said. And that's it. And what God has said is enough. We don't need a second volume. The Bible part two. Don't need it. I'll trust God if he takes this away. <laughs> I'll trust God if he takes this away. Oh, so you need results first before you're going to go and dive in, huh? Okay. All right, let me simplify that answer for you. God, if you take this away, I'll go to church more often. <laughs> now you're testing God. You just made him into a game host. You know, let's make a deal. Here, you do this for me, God, and I'll do this for you. Because God really needs you to sit in church for an hour. Hmm. Interesting, huh? That also makes it sound like it's painful to sit here and listen to me. <laughs> that bothers me more. You know, that's what, oh, I have to go to church. I'll do this, God. I'll sacrifice. Great. I hope that person's from another church when they say it. Just saying, okay? Prove to me that you're real. Usually in times of desperation, we'll say that. Please prove to me that you're real. God has proved it. He has proved it over and over and over. The problem is, is we're so self-centered and so sinful. We want to have him do it just for us and not for mankind. He does it for mankind and we just get so upset it wasn't our own personal show. Something God did just for us. Now the next one, yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be kind. How people use Scripture to their advantage. No one does that, right? No one does that. It's amazing to me, and I've said this so many times. It gets to me. I love it when somebody who is not a Christian or a believer quotes Scripture to defend their point. Oh, I thought Christians, they were supposed to, and they quote a Scripture. Now, the funny part is, they're able to do that. Why? Because they don't have to go by the laws of context. They can just randomly pick little passages of Scripture and throw them out when they want it as little hand grenades to be able to blow up the, the adversary here and there. We don't have that luxury as Christians. We have to ha read it in context, apply it in context. We need to be able to back it up with other Scripture. So you see, just as the devil quotes the pa passages and might know the passages, so do unbelievers and false teachers. We need to be aware of that. And that's how we get tempted. Sometimes we respect somebody so much that they throw a passage out, and it could be out of context, and we just like them so much that we believe what they said, even though what they said is not true. You know, then we put people over Scripture. Politicians are using Scripture. That scares me to death. I'm thinking Jesus is coming anytime. I'm waiting to hear the trumpet blast. No, come on. Come on. We know full well that that is inappropriate. Especially the way that you're using Scripture. But it's not just the politicians, not just the devil. It could be friends, it could be family, people we respect. But if you don't know the Word of God, how would you know? How would you know it's out of context? How would you know that that passage was meant just for the Israelites and you're using it to your own personal gain? You see what I mean? That's why it's so important, and I can't tell you enough, be in the Word. Because the devil doesn't take a day off. He doesn't. And he's waiting till you're most weak, hungry if you like. And he will come to attack. 
no doubt. We are to know Scripture in context and not just random passages to apply any way we want. Last one, here we go. Third test, devil scheme, to tempt Jesus with power, possessions, prosperity. Just remember, he said, look, I'll make you king of the world. All the kingdoms of the earth are yours. All the riches are yours. Power over the people is yours. That's a big shot, right? Man, oh man, oh man, this can all be yours. But you just have to worship me. That's all, little thing. It seemed that way, right? Satan wanted to have Jesus turn away from God, to put things before God, and to submit to the devil in his will instead of God's. Here's Jesus' response. Showing the devil he has no authority over him. You notice how he just makes it very clear? You know, Jesus in that text, I'll read it to you just because we have a moment. I want to. <laughs> Away from me. I love that. Away from me, Satan. So who's in control in this conversation? The devil or Jesus? Jesus. And I love that. I love that. And then the final piece that he goes on to do is that he orders him to leave. Leave. Wow, you know something? Because of who Jesus is, the devil has to submit. He has to listen. Now, Jesus quotes again from Deuteronomy 6.13. Away from me, Satan, he says, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Hmm. So how do we apply this today? Just like Jesus, the devil has no authority over you. You do know that, right? Scripture says that the devil's roaming around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour in James. But the truth is, as a Christian, he can't touch you. He can't touch you. He can tempt you. He's not going to touch you because you have the authority of Christ. The same Christ that said, go away, gives us the authority to do the same thing. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and what? He will flee from you. Scripture. So let us remember Jesus has overcome sin, death, and the devil. He has passed all three tests. And because he's passed all three tests, and we haven't, we turn to the one who has. We say, forgive me, for I am weak, but you are strong. I have sinned and you have not. Wash away all my sin, Lord, for Christ Jesus' sake. Then a voice from heaven cries down something very simple. You are forgiven in Christ Jesus. That, to me, is what I need. How about you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there was a lot of information today. I pray that we wouldn't just say, well, I heard what he said. But instead, maybe you do our own little research today. Or maybe when we have our snow and you're stuck home, you just open your Bible and take some time to read and to learn. So, Lord, help us to be aware. Help us to see the pitfall, pitfalls and potholes. And to know the devil's scheme so we are equipped in season and out to be able to fight the good fight of faith. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Jesus Calls Us, number 592 in your hymnal. Let's stand.
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest upon each and every one of you. May his peace go with you into your home, workplace, school, and community. And may his peace take reign in your heart from this day forth. I pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll close our worship with Close to Thee. It's hymn number 607. We'll do the first verse.